So we've had a representative from Airbnb speak at this conference actually since we started in Europe. And I remember when your predecessor first spoke. And at that time, he just made the announcement that I think that year, Europe had become the largest market for, for Airbnb. Uh, but you guys have grown dramatically globally, and Asia has been a market you've talked about a lot. So can you just give us a rundown, you know, maybe a little bit more deeper than just the 4.2 or 4.3 million listings, but where, where is Airbnb today in terms of scale and, and growth, and where does Europe fit into that? Sure. So um, uh, we're, we're celebrating this year, actually, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary. Um, 10th anniversary since we, um, two of the founders uh, inflated their first air beds. So a lot of things changed. Um, are, you, does that, are you no longer a startup? We're trying to keep the mentality of a startup. Um, I think it's a very important one for us. Um, but at the same time, we also need to consolidate a lot more things due to the scale that we have. Mm. So we need to find the best of both worlds, which how, I think how, is a lot of companies struggle with. Right? How do you keep a, sorry, I'm not letting you answer the first question, but how do you, so how do you maintain that, that culture of a startup when you, you have a well, private market valuation of 30, 31 billion, you've got how many thousands of employees around the world? How it's, do you do that? It's, it's a really good question. I think one of the things that sets us apart is um, the fact that we are founder-led. So um, being founder-led, and Brian has a tremendous influence still on the entire company. He's not just a C CEO, but he's also a little bit the heart and the soul of the, the, the company. Um, and that really helps us to, to do several things. So the, the first thing is uh, the constant drive for that mission, right? A lot of people, if you take a look at the Glassdoor interviews of people um, uh, talking about Airbnb, whether it's their current or their ex uh, company, they constantly remind themselves about the mission. Our mission is belong anywhere, and a lot of people um, are appealed by that. So um, they go the extra mile in order to work for a company that has such a strong mission. The second one. What is your mission? Belong anywhere. So no matter where you go, no matter where you stay, you feel that you belong in the place that you are at that moment in time. Okay. Okay, so that's the first one. I think the second one is um, the obsession with being on the ground. I think right at the beginning, one of the things that the founders um, did really well was getting to know their individual users. Could be guests, could be hosts. They didn't just get to know them, they actually lived with them. They went to New York and stayed with all of the individual hosts. That's where some of the initial ideas of um, uh, the, the photography, professional photography for everybody um, started, right? We need to continue to, to make But how do, you, how do you do that with a scale? With the, I mean, that is the fundamental challenge with four million plus yeah. listings. How do you maintain for, that? For me, it's the culture of maintaining that. And the culture of maintaining that is hiring the right people, um, making sure that people continue to be engaged and our engagement score. So if, overall, in, in um, all of the companies, 13% of the people feel engaged with the work that they do. 13%, 1-3%, right? If you take a look at Airbnb, our engagement scores are above 80%. That engagement scores um, are really the driver, I think, for um, the fact that we continue to innovate, the fact that we um, continue to, to be a, a startup. It could be in very small things, and it could be really broad, new, very ambitious ideas. But it starts with everybody, and we need to maintain that engagement because that's, what's, that's a special sauce that sets a, a company like Airbnb apart. But the, the, the company is also going through some pretty extraordinary changes. We've seen uh, certain areas, new product areas like experiences and other things that you've talked about, which I think fit into that kind of visionary ideal right, that you described. But on the other hand, there are things that you guys are doing more like engaging with large property management companies. And there's yep. a lot of debate about the extent to which you've gone from that kind of individual host experience to, uh, to becoming more of a kind of a commodity type of, uh, of marketplace and then going into hotels as well. So how do you, how do you grow and scale and still... Um, you know, like how, how can I feel like I belong somewhere where you know, there's no check-in desk and I'm just getting into my apartment with a, yep. you know, with a it's, it's a It's a really good question, and we've debated that uh, uh, a lot internally within, within the company. Um, so we started from uh, an extreme, the very first listing was both business travel, people were staying um, on the three uh, initial air mattresses um, for business in a way, and it was home sharing. So we've grown um, in those 10 years, we've grown from a home sharing company to an accommodation company 
to what I would now call a travel slash hospitality company. And that's a little bit like, in a nutshell, that's the evolution that we've seen over the last um, uh, 10 years. Um, it's true that as you become bigger and uh, as you start to appeal to bigger audience, so 300 million people have stayed with us, um, and those are 300 million individuals that look for um, something different, something unique, right? So there's traditional hospitality providers that fit the classification of providing unique and great hospitality experiences perfectly. You don't have to be an individual. You could be a professional at it. And therefore, we need to find the right balance of saying um, there's individuals. 72% of our entire inventory of all of the listings, all of the homes that we have on the platform is still unique to us. So starting with that. There is, however, um, uh, another audience. Our internal audience, the millennials that used to use uh, Airbnb five years ago, six years ago, started to grow. They start to have families. They start to have jobs. So we need to cater to that um, audience. And that's the first thing that we, we try to do. Amongst the five million uh, listings that we have, it was really hard to find. So we did a classification, and then we also called out specific segments, right? Specific collections, both for Airbnb for work, as well as um, uh, Airbnb for, for families. So that's the, the, the first thing. The second thing is, and we also realize if our mission is belong um, everywhere, and um, we want everybody to be encompassed by that, that we need to go to the next step. So there's a lot of people who still think that Airbnb is more for the backpackers, for the millennials, for um, uh, budget travel. And that's something that we wanted to change. So what we did in order to do that is, one, we expanded with two categories, boutique hotels and, um, and bed and breakfast. And expanding is a relative word, because we already had 180,000 boutique hotel rooms on our platform. We already had 25,000. Um, uh, bed and breakfast, sorry, mm. we already had 25,000 uh, boutique hotel rooms on our platform. So it's just, they were on there, we didn't provide them the right tools in order to operate efficiently, and they were getting really good experience, because if you don't provide the right experience, um, you don't belong on the platform. Okay, but, the, so, but there's also a lot of, say, say, vacation rental kind of condo, and even there's been some reporting of some large, I think there's one host that had like, I don't know, 800, you know, basically Wyndham timeshare units that they had put, you know, on the, on the platform. So is that, like, is that kind of content, is that, is that welcome? Is, does that have a place? Like, is there a future where, I mean, where there is more kind of, uh, I would say, uh, mass market or commoditized product? Uh, there's definitely a market uh, for that, I think. But is that market on Airbnb? Is so we, we need to, it's a very fine line between um, something that people are looking for and maintaining our, um, uh, our DNA of personalized hospitality, right? People-powered, uh, driven hospitality. Um, that's where I think um, even though there might be a more unified approach, a more structured approach, a more um, an anonymous approach to, to the accommodation, where our experiences uh, can provide an additional layer in order to provide that differentiation. Not everybody wants to stay with a host or have that hug upon arrival, which is completely fine. Um, if you're traveling with your family and you, um, uh, you want to maximize the time you spend with them during your vacation, during one or two weeks uh, when you're in the south of France, which is completely fine, completely understandable. Um, at the same time, uh, we want to make sure that Hospitality, for me, what sets it apart is the fact that it's experience-driven and it, the experiences are provided by people. So um, that's something with our experience layer that we can put on top of that for saying if my accommodation is cross-listed that we can still provide yeah, but Okay, but every, every hotel has people. <laughs> every, you go to a, any hotel, you have an experience. So what distinguishes if I book a boutique hotel on Airbnb and I book that same boutique hotel on Expedia or Booking.com, how is my experience different? Yeah, I think in that specific example, um, we wanted to make sure is that everybody is finding whatever they're looking for on Airbnb. So if you're booking exactly the same hotel on an Airbnb or on a Booking.com, I think the experience is not going to be necessarily that different, right? Mm -hmm. I think our UI sets us apart. I think our um, customer service, um, that's 24 hours, our guarantees, our reviews, and, and so on. So the user experience of booking um, could set it apart. And then we're looking at the overall trip, the overall um, experience. Um, what are some of the other touch points where we can interact with you, where we can make sure is that whether you're staying for business or for leisure, that we, that we still provide that uniqueness of the trip. So uh, there's one, uh, well, there's been a lot of critics of Airbnb uh, over the years. I think increasingly some of the hotel companies have been, well, over the years, quite, quite critical. But there's one quote I just want to bring up just to kind of 
wrap up this conversation. Uh, so uh, there's an article uh, that quoted Sebastian Bazin of Accor Hotels. And so he's, and he's spoken quite a bit about you, in some cases very, uh, very admiringly about Airbnb. But this I thought was quite interesting. He said, this is earlier this year, Airbnb has lost its soul. It's become volume driven and not emotion driven. Is that, you think that, is that? It goes back to what we were talking about, yeah. right? Um, uh, if you take a look at the core of everything we do is still people powered. Again, 72% of our entire listings, of our entire base is unique to Airbnb, is an individual. That's what, that's what we've done, that's how we've grown, and that's what we need to, to, to treasure. Now, if you how, how many of those are, are by individual proprietors as opposed to kind of multi-unit operators? No, so 80, 80% of the listings that we have mm -hmm. are owned by individuals. Or individuals, okay. Is somebody renting out their primary or their secondary uh, space. Okay. Yeah. Um, it even goes further. 53% uh, of the people say, this actually helps me to pay my rent um, and to pay my, my mortgage. So it goes beyond that, right? But to, to, to come back to your, your, your point, so that's one thing. We, want to, we don't want to be a commodity. We want to be a community-driven brand. Um, and that's one way of doing it. Mm. Um, the fact that community-driven brand doesn't overly invest in uh, necessarily the, the marketing. We don't have the same budget as some of the, the other OTAs. What we, what we do specifically well is word of mouth. Yeah, continue to have a great experience. Our NPS for me is one of the critical metrics of making sure that people can talk about Airbnb and when they talk about Airbnb, they continue to talk about it in a positive way because the opposite could work and it works. A negative experience um, is 10 times more um, uh, viral than a positive experience. Hmm. But 60% of all the traffic we have is organic traffic. So we have a, v a very good word of mouth uh, uh, machine based upon the good personal experiences that we provide. How big do you think hotels as a category could be? I mean, you've done some very clear kind of proactive industry engagement and marketing. I think I've seen some material too, which is basically said, hey, you know, it's 3% if you list your hotel on, on Airbnb, that's a lot better than 15, 20, 20 plus percent on um, other companies that also offer hotel booking. Uh, so, uh, so clearly you want more and more hotels. Uh, Five years from now, is our hotels 5%, 25%? Yeah, let me just clarify, and, and you know this, but our, yep. our business model is, is not the 3%, so we have a host fee and we have a guest fee. Um, the, the difference is that it's uh, variable and we can actually play with that depending mm -hmm. on the quantity, the higher the quantity, the lower the volume um, of, of the, the, the take rate and so on. So um, we, we, need to, we need to make sure is that we compare apples to apples. So that's, that's the, the one thing. And then um, we, we've seen that actually it's the hotels who are looking for um, diversification of channels. They mm -hmm. uh, say we have a high dependency on very few channels. We want to make sure is that we're able to diversify that. If it's at a better cost, even better. But diversification, I think, is, is the main driver for that. How big can it be? It's hard to say um, at, at the moment. We've just started. Um, I think we've, we've announced it in, in, in February. Um, this is something that's going to continue to evolve, and we have still a lot of work to do in order to, to get to where we want to get and to continue to provide that great service that we were known for on the peer-to-peer -peer side, also to the more now, traditional hospitality side. Now, I think I've also read that you're doing some experiments where you're offering kind of a higher a higher uh, kind of commission and a lower consumer fee at, with, with certain properties to see if that will drive more business. Can, we're we're can constantly, you, like, we're, we're constantly uh, this is not something new, this is not something that we're uh, at the moment rolling out uh, globally, but we're constantly testing out these things, right? We have 100 A-B tests going on in parallel at the same time. This is just uh, uh, one of them, yeah. Uh, so if I'm an, it's, it's a very interesting dynamic, so in particular between the traditional OTA model and you. So if I'm an individual homeowner, do I list on Airbnb or do I list on, on booking? How do I make more money? How do I manage that? So what, and booking has been very clear, no, no customer fees. It's all, you know, it's all commission. Customer free, uh, fees are not customer friendly. Uh, so. Is there room for, for both? Certainly from a homeowner perspective, I don't think most individual owners probably go through, you know, they're not using revenue management, right, and trying to figure out, you know, what should they price it and how am I going to, what's going to generate more bookings for me and, and more income? So, so I, I think we need to differentiate between um, an individual renting out their primary residence um, and uh, does it 
compensate for him or her to uh, go through the entire hassle of cross-listing, maintaining different calendars on different platforms and so on, or, or not. I think what we've seen at least is that uh, a lot of the, the uh, primary homes stay unique to our platform because we are so well tailored to providing exactly that kind of uh, uh, offering, whether it's from the user experience or from the customer service uh, point of view. Um, but there's definitely a, a, a lot of uh, listings that are more professionally managed that are going to cross-list and going to try to balance uh, the, the income and the revenue that they take across the different platforms. So yeah, no doubt. So uh, one of the things that you've also introduced is sort of like a Lux category. Now there's Airbnb Plus, yep. a kind of, which I see as a, basically a kind of in, the introduction of standards or a professionalization a bit of the, the sector. So is that, are we going to see, is that where the industry is, is going and are there going to be more categories? And is there going to be a, is there a hotel category or could there be a future like, what, what does that look like uh, in the future for you? Because right now, like, you don't have filters, really, like in other OTAs, so... We, we, ha we have quite a lot of filters, like uh, what is the property type, what okay. are, the, All right. okay. what are yeah. um, the locations, uh, price range, and, and so on. Um, but but I, I take your yeah. point, right? Yeah. I think um, as we grew up um, and, and throughout that whole uh, evolution from home sharing to accommodation to, to uh, travel, um, it, it is hard uh, to find what exactly you're looking for. So this is one of the things that we wanted to, to make easier. And the first thing that we did, like I said before, was uh, provide clarity to what exactly are you reserving. Yeah? Is it uh, a home? Is it a dedicated rental? Is it a bed and breakfast? Is it uh, a room? Is it a unique property like an igloo or uh, a tree uh, house or something like that? So that's the, the first thing. Um, we have all the data, but it wasn't um, there in a structured way. So that's the first thing. It makes it easier. Then with Plus, you um, basically tailor to the people who had that barrier of saying, is Airbnb really for me? Like, I'm not sure what to expect. And we go through a checklist of 100 points um, individually, so um, every listing at, uh, at a time, where we can basically then guarantee that, yeah, you'll have broad, broadband Wi-Fi and there'll be 24-hour check-in and so on and so on. So it's for the people who are a little bit more skeptical, who think that mm, maybe it's not for me, and we have better arguments now to convince them, try it out, because we've checked these 100 points for you. Douglas, and, we have a, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. continue. And um, uh, the, the Lux or the Beyond business that we've announced, uh, takes that to the next level, and there's a checklist of 250 uh, different points. Okay. Question from the floor. Uh, Valentin Dombrovsky, my square. Uh, Jeroen, I want to get, back, uh, to get back a bit to one of your points, uh, speaking about like emotional feeling about Airbnb and uh, that customers uh, feel so well about Airbnb that they recommend it and so on and so on. But what I also know from company history and from what I've read that Airbnb is actually doing a lot on um, enhancing its referral program and enhancing the, this viral component that, that we are talking about. So the question, my question would be, maybe a bit arguing with your point, so is it a customer emotional feeling towards Airbnb that drives this uh, organic traffic that we are talking about? Or is it Airbnb knowledge about people behavior and um, skills to drive this viral effect that actually drives organic traffic. And I think it will be useful for people in the audience to understand that organic traffic is not so organic as it seems. Yeah. What do you think? So, so a really, really good question. Thank you for that. So um, I think at the basis of everything, no matter whether you have a referral program or not, people are not going to refer to you um, unless they feel that they have something that offers value to them and they can recommend it, right? So um, we, we have a lot of referral programs and we're continuing to, to optimize that, so there, there's a big part of that. Um, but you're only going to continue to do that if you had a great experience. Um, you're not going to refer somebody uh, if something just happened and you weren't really entirely happy with the experience, right? So I think that's the, 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 the first point. The second point is, um, as part of that referral program, um, we, uh, we actually uh, wanted to, to make sure is that it, it goes bigger and that the NPS that we uh, really, like our NPS score is above 70% for a hospitality company is incredibly uh, high, um, that we can continue to foster that. So uh, we're not optimized necessarily for transaction, which would 
make that virality a lot easier, were optimized for trust, right? It's not that easy to register on Airbnb. It's not that easy to get in touch with a, a host and so on. There's a couple of things that we're doing in order to make it easier, but we don't want to be necessarily a transactional company. Um, we want to be a trust company. So a lot of these things that we are doing um, uh, goes back to that. And then obviously the virality is, a, is, a, is something that goes with that. It, it's something that we have to cherish. It's something that sets us apart. You have, one, you have a question? Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a journalist for Hospitality Insight in Germany. I have two quick questions for you, Jeroen. The first one, um, uh, your company has actually grown tremendously fast over the years, and uh, it seems that according to experts and analysts, you reach a certain plateau in terms of growth and inventory. I would like to know what you think about that. And the second question would be uh, about the gray areas in terms of legislations that your company has benefited and played with uh, or played around uh, over the years as well to grow and, and, um, um, and spread. Uh, and it worked pretty well. But today, uh, it, it seems that many cities are um, restricting their legislations or make it clearer for companies like yours. And I would like to know if it's going to uh, prevent you from growing as fast as you, you, you did over the, year, the past okay. years. I, I just want to make a point that neither of those questions are quick. However, yeah. <laughs> we can be and, and I have two minutes. So, um, so our, our growth rates are still above 50%, right? Um, with the size that we are at the moment, um, I'm not worried about the growth rates. Obviously, if you look at percentage growth, uh, your percentage growth as you continue to grow and mass uh, volume uh, is going to slow down uh, percentage-wise, but still the, the, the absolute numbers are going to continue to rise. So I'm not worried about our growth rates, and I think we're, we're in, in, in pretty good shape. About the regulation, it's, it's a very long discussion, obviously. Um, uh, we don't play with regulation. We want to make sure, um, at the size that we are at the moment, is we are looking proactively for a regulation. We invest a lot of time and a lot of resources in working with national governments, regional governments, city halls, and so on, in order to explain some of the concepts that we've seen in some of the other cities, um, whether it's over tourism, housing, and so on, whatever the issue is, or depending on what the issue is, what are the directions that we're able to go. Um, this is not something that you play with. I think we're a very responsible player, and uh, we have a role to play in providing and working towards the regulation. Uh, we just want it to, to, to be fair. So um, we're seeing that the more we debate and the more we communication we have, the more advancements we have. And the latest regulations in some of the cities, I don't know, uh, London, Berlin, and so on, uh, go into that direction, right? Where the thing that is fairly new uh, towards collaborative consumption, home sharing, and so on, is, um, is now becoming uh, regulated in a very similar way across Europe, across different jurisdictions. That's something that we cherish, and it's something we, we work together towards. Okay, so, uh, so really quick, uh, flights, not, not in, the, in the near term. Not gonna Fli flights is something um, that at the moment we're evaluating, seeing what should we do if we want to do it, um, and if we have something to announce, we'll announce it. Other right transportation, time. car rental? Same thing. So the big announcements from a year and a half ago were just visionary. Okay, the announcement that we made a couple of years ago is saying, look, if we want to be an overall travel company, um, there's some of the things that we cover, um, uh, which is accommodation. There's some of the things that we uh, are covering now and in, in the moment of uh, scaling up, with, like experiences. There's some of the things that in the future we want to look at what is the right way to but, cover. But experiences, you guys are doubling down, going yes. all in. Yes. So, and, and when am I going to see uh, the... Uh, hop on, hop off, bus tour, uh, Disney World tickets, and all the things that most tourists still do in destinations. Is that going to happen anytime I, soon? Anytime soon? No, this is not something, again, you can find that on plenty of other platforms. It's not something okay. that would be unique to Airbnb, therefore it doesn't have a place. Okay. Very last question. I, at the end of the day, I get to interview your predecessor who's gone to Booking.com. So if you were me, what would you ask Olivier? Uh, interesting one. Um, he's got a bit of time to prepare for it, so um, ask him what he is most proud of looking back at his time at Airbnb. Oh, that's boring. Come on. Let's get some, I, want some, I want some dirt. I'll ask him about the biggest mistake he made. <laughs> Absolutely. Apart Ladies from moving to Booking.com. <laughs> okay. yeah. anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeroen Bechers, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.